Welcome to Pennsylvania Newsmakers, and as always, thanks for watching. Well, bipartisan police reform legislation passes, uh, robots at your door. But first, let's take a look at assistance with your utility bill. Let's get to it. Welcome to the fast-paced and unrehearsed weekly discussion featuring the leaders who help shape your world. Join us as we address the issues that impact you each and every day. This is Pennsylvania Newsmakers. And now, here's your host, Terry Madonna. Welcome back. Well, joining me first is Terry Fitzpatrick. He's the president and CEO of the Energy Association of Pennsylvania. Terry Fitzpatrick, welcome to the program as always. Thank you, Terry. Good to be here again. All right. Before we get to the utility bill situation, which is very important, let's talk about energy use and production. It's obviously down and it has a big effect on the economy. Where does it all stand? Yeah, Terry, you're right. With the COVID uh, pandemic, as with so many things, um, energy usage is down. Um, for example, manufacturing plants that, that had to shut down or slow down back in March using less electricity, natural gas. Uh, people are driving less, uh, not commuting to work. Maybe some people going on vacation, but a lot of people putting that off. So energy usage is down. And, and you're right, that does have an impact on the economy. Uh, there is one sector that's up, though. Um, residential energy use is up because of people working at home uh, <laughs> using more electricity, more somewhat more natural gas as a result of that. Yeah. Well, look, thanks. Thanks for the update. I want to talk about this moratorium on utility termination. The PUC, the Pennsylvania mm -hmm. Utility Commission, as I understand it, put in place the moratorium way back in March. Where does all that stand? And well, first of all, what what actually is it? And what does it mean? Yeah, moratorium is kind of a fancy word, trips people up. Uh, it, it simply means that utilities cannot terminate service to any customer. Um, the, you're right. The PUC put that in place back in March through an order. And they said on, through the period during which the governor's emergency proclamation is in effect, utilities can't turn off service. Now, I, I do want to emphasize that utilities most utilities had made that decision on their own even before the order came out. I mean, they knew customers were going to be struggling. They wanted to give them some assurance, at least for a period of time, that that was one thing they wouldn't have to worry about if they were having problems. So yeah. um, the, the, the moratorium is still in effect now. And in fact, just last night, we had a decision by the state Supreme Court upholding the gover governor's emergency proclamation. So the termination moratorium remains in effect. We think it ought to be taken off, but it, whether it, when the, while the exact timing isn't clear, it will be removed at some point. So customers need to take care of, of, of their bills. And if they have been having problems, they need to contact their utility. Yeah. Well, let me, let me uh, re rephrase a question a bit. Is the legal status certain or uncertain given the Supreme Court decision? It, the, the legal status is certain now, given the Supreme Court's decision. It was somewhat uncertain up until the Supreme Court's decision because the legislature took the position that they had passed a concurrent resolution right. ending the proclamation. Um, until the courts resolved that, it was unclear. But now with the state Supreme Court decision, that's cleared that up. Yeah. So let, let, let me put it this way. What do you do about a bill, a customer should do about a bill if, if, if you know, they're running, they can't pay, they're running into other kinds of problems with it. What, what should a customer do? Call the energy company, I would think, right? Yeah, well, the first, the, the thing I really want to emphasize, Terry, what they shouldn't do is nothing. I mean, because he, he, there's a lot of different ways that they can be helped, but it requires them contacting their utility company to get that whole process started. Um, for customers, regardless of your income level, uh, there are a number of things that, that the company can do to, to help you. There's budget billing where, you know, you can eliminate spikes in your bills by spreading out the cost over a whole year. There are payment plans. If you've, if you've gotten an arrearage build up, you can pay it back gradually over time. There are hardship funds. For customers who, um, who meet the income qualifications who are low income, there's really a slew of assistance programs available there. There's customer assistance programs through the utility where you pay a discounted bill. Uh, there's government programs available, the low income home energy assistance program. Congress allocated a lot of additional money to that. 
in their uh, legislation to deal with the pandemic. So there's grants up to $800 available for that. But, but all of that requires that the customer take some initiative, don't put this off. And you know, it's natural to put this off, Terry. We all put things off. Oh, I put things off. Right. And especially unpleasant things. People tend not to want to deal with it, but really you can't, you, it, the problem just gets worse if you do that. So please, you know, contact your utility company, get the process starting to get some help. Well, look, I want to thank you for coming on the program. You, you come frequently and keep us up to date. We'll, we'll see you soon. Thanks, Terry. All right. Coming up, we have State Senator Scott Martin. He's, he's coming on the program. We have a whole bunch of topics. And in, in, in one important topic I think everyone wants to hear about ha, has, has to do with police reform legislation. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is presented by the Pennsylvania Chamber of Business and Industry, the statewide voice of business, and by the Pennsylvania State Education Association and Partners for Public Education, bringing the power of a great education to our schools, our students, and our communities. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is brought to you by the Pennsylvania Highway Information Association, the go-to source to learn about transportation projects and issues. Please visit pahighwayinfo.org. And by the Pennsylvania Manufacturers Association. Business in Pennsylvania is our business. Joining me now is State Senator Scott Martin. He represents the 13th Senatorial District in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. I didn't say Lancaster, I said Lancaster. How are you, Senator? I'm doing good, Terry. It's great to be back. Oh, it's my pleasure. All right, well, let's start with uh, police reform measures. Two of them passed the Senate, and you'll correct me if I'm wrong, unanimously. So what we end up with here is something that many other states and the federal government can't get done is Democrats and Republicans working together to pass important pieces of reform legislation dealing, deal, dealing with the police in our state. Do I got that right? Uh, absolutely. You know, a lot of folks would be surprised. Probably 80 percent of what we do get done in the Senate is usually passed unanimously and bipartisan. Uh, but the police reform bills uh, were no different. Uh, all the stakeholders coming together and, and and passing legislation that everyone thought would be in the best interest moving forward, uh, not only for our, our communities, but also our law enforcement community. And we're really happy yeah. uh, that, that we're able to put it on the governor's desk. Well, what were the two major elements? There were two bills. What were the major elements in those bills for help? So our viewers, we all have a good understanding of it. Well, it, 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 it's, it's part of a broader package, all, all these bills. And, and obviously, uh, you know, I think you saw last week when we uh, barred chokeholds, except in, uh, in, in, in places where the officer's life's in, in jeopardy. Um, this one dealt with train. We have training, uh, and particularly how to uh, uh, be around diverse groups of people and interact with them. Uh, and of course, one of the big ones was obviously keeping the records of, of law enforcement um, records from prior employment in a centralized location with MOPAC, who does a lot of the police training that's accessible to other departments when they hire an officer uh, to ensure, just like with any business, if you, someone had an issue in the past um, that would be very concerning to uh, you know, put and give law enforcement powers to that you wouldn't want to do, they have access to that information. Yeah, and Governor Wolf does support it, so there's no, there's no problem there. All right, I want to move on to uh, some legislation uh, that deal, dealing with sexual assault that I think is important. So what, 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 where, first of all, what are, what, what are the major elements in it and, and, and where, where is it likely to go in the legislature? Well, it seems I'm getting good bipartisan interest in it. And Terry, sadly enough, I'd like to say that this issue was brought to my attention by a constituent whose daughter was raped uh, after hours uh, after a local fair. And lo and behold, after going through the process, 
to find out that the uh, rapist was going to be returning to the school after their disposition from from the juvenile system. I, I couldn't imagine a scenario where we would say, you know, you're you're going to have to go to school with your rapist or your only option is for you as the victim to have to leave your school. So what this bill does is it basically prevents an offender um, from being placed in that same building uh, as a youth. They have to look at alternatives. They can't ride the same school bus or be part of the same school uh, activities. Uh, but lo and behold, it was really shocking to me to find out that we have a lot of those scenarios and our schools deal with sexual assault and, and having to deal with this more often than any of us really know. And this bill will actually give some clear guidelines. All right, we're going to run to a quick break. When we come back, I, I want to get into the, another important subject, uh, pediatric cancer, something I know you have a great interest in. All right, let's run to a break. We'll be back in a moment. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is brought to you by Cross State Credit Union Association. Credit unions, where people are worth more than money. To find a credit union that is right for you, go to ibelong.org and by the Energy Association of Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania's energy information source. Doing time, they have to do. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is brought to you by the Association of Pennsylvania State College and University Faculties, representing the faculty and coaches who are devoted to providing quality public higher education for Pennsylvania's college students. All right, I'm chatting with Scott Martin. He's a senator, state senator from the 13th a senatorial district in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Before we get on to uh, uh, another aspect of uh, legislation that you're in, involved with, I do have another question. Where does the sexual assault legislation stand in, ter well, in, in the process? Yeah, currently it can't, it's out of education committee. Uh, we're working on a technical amendment to clearly define better um, the fact that the offense has to occur with two students from the same building, um, which is an agreed upon thing that we're working on. But hopefully uh, by you know, by this fall, we'll have this bill done. And we're working with folks in the House in preparation already. And you're up and you're, you're telling me that this has bipartisan support. Oh, absolutely. Oh, absolutely. OK. OK. All right. Another very important topic, pediatric cancer. Uh, where does that? What, first of all, explain to our viewers what that's what the bill is about. Well, we, we've done a lot of work over the years uh, with these families that need so much of our help. You know, less than 4% of pediatric cancer research dollars, actually, or research cancer dollars go to pediatric cancer research. Um, and we've been working with a lot of the families who have been devastated by this. Uh, a lot of the children who not only are battling the disease have been just amazing partners and advocates in Harrisburg. But we passed Senate Bill 74, uh, which would establish a pediatric cancer tax credit um, and it would be $10 million a year over 10 years to the four major research institutions in Pennsylvania. Uh, it, I was another bill, I'm proud to say, passed with unanimous support from the Senate. Uh, it clearly sits uh, right now in the House and, and, and fits into the broader budget picture about where things go. Uh, but I'm really proud of the chamber from the standpoint that this would be our third bill that we've gotten out to assist families. Uh, the first was when you renew your vehicle registration, you can check off a box and the monies go to pediatric cancer research. Right. Uh, we passed the bill uh, with telepresence for kids going through treatment that they could still virtually be part of their classroom with their peers and not feel isolated. Uh, we passed that last year and that's, that's now in every single IU 13 across the Commonwealth available to every single school yeah. district. Uh, so we're really proud of our effort, and those kids need our help. Boy, I'll tell you, when you t think about subjects that ought to be on the top of everybody list, fighting pediatric—I mean, how can you, how could, how can you not rate that, list that, define that as one of the most important issues that needs to be dealt with? Absolutely, and it's not a political issue. This is a life and death issue for these families, and uh, absolutely, and we need to stand. We need to stand with them. All right, I want to talk about one other thing. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, you all in the legislature passed a budget 
for five months, except for the schools and the public universities, where that, that budget would be for a year. But the problem is you now have a $3.2 billion shortfall in the revenues that have been collected, according to the reports from this past week. And $1.95 billion of it, or if I got that right, yeah, $1.9 billion of it comes from shortfalls in tax collections, which have been put off the budget. It, it, I'll tell you, at some point, you all are going to have to reconcile that. And, and taxes, you know, right now, are going to be tough to impose, I would think. Yeah, you know, it, it, with an economic slowdown and people struggling, it's one of the worst times to ever even think about doing a tax increase. And you're right, the timing of when taxes are due is a huge component. Some of that deficit will be cut pretty much, I'd say, on average in half. But when we come down to looking at the second half of this budget, um, we will have the time to see where does the economy go from here. And, and that's the big unknown right now. How many people are we going to get off this, his, this historic unemployment rolls and get their businesses up, up and running. And that, as you see, has been some of this tug of war through this, is there's a belief that we believe we can be doing a lot more safely. Um, and hopefully that would translate into more revenues coming in. But if not, there's going to be a lot of tough decisions coming down yeah. the pike, or reforms that are needed for that second part of the year. Well, obviously, the best thing would be for the economy to improve significantly. And there's a big debate about how quickly it will improve, although the job upbeat was pretty good for the last month. And we're just going to have to see where it all goes. Well, look, I want to thank you for coming on the program. You're always welcome. And uh, keep us posted on the important uh, things that are going on in the legislature. I'm uh, one of, just one quick point. I'm delighted that there's so much bipartisan support for some of this important legislation. Correct. No, uh, it, it is. It shows that we can we can rally around topics for the common good, um, and we'd like to see a lot more of that going on across the yeah. board. But Terry, it's always a pleasure to be with you, and and look forward to coming right. back. Well, you won't believe this next topic coming up with uh, another guest: robots at your door. I'm not making that up at all. We'll be back. Senator Almond's robots. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll be back in a moment. Right. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is brought to you by the Pennsylvania Medical Society. Inspired physicians committed to the good health of Pennsylvanians and the advancement of the practice of medicine. Brad Bumstead joins me. He is the bureau chief of the caucus. Brad Bumstead, a longtime reporter uh, covering uh, the state legislature and uh, all things political in Pennsylvania. Do I got that right? You got it right. All right. I can't believe this topic you and I chatted about. Robots at your door. I can't you can't make that up. What's what's that all about? And what's going to happen when my dog hears a knock on the door and we open it up and she sees a robot? You know? <laughs> Actually, the Senate passed a bill uh, just this week that um, sets the rules and parameters for companies using robots for delivery of, of, of packages to doors of residences and businesses. Uh, and there had to be, it's interesting, there had to be you know, rules set up for, um, they, they can't jaywalk, for instance. They have to you know, stop at, at a light. Now, and, hold on. A robot can't jaywalk? Well, right. They have to wait till the light changes to be. They have to be able to follow the basic rules. But the problem is, uh, you know, till we get used to these things, uh, it's it's going to be pretty strange when it happens. I don't know how far off, but yeah, I was going to ask you that. that. Bill, how how imminent I mean? how imminent are robots before they're at our door? Is it is it? Well, firstly, with this bill, it has to pass the House again next and then also be signed by the governor. But assuming that happens, maybe a year or so. All right, let's go to what a very important topic. It has to do with revenue for the state, but it also has to do with a lot of activities of Pennsylvanians, and it has to do with gaming expansion. So what's the latest with that? Well, about two weeks ago, Terry, out of the blue came this proposal that we we're hearing about that the Senate leaders, uh, President uh, Scarnati, and, and uh, uh, Jake Corman from Center County, the majority leader, were trying to uh, um, get the votes needed to bring to the floor 
to pass a dual measure, one that would legalize the, the skill games that we see out here that have proliferated over the past year at, at uh, 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 gas stations and, and restaurants around the state. And then also with that, uh, legalized VGTs, video gaming terminals, which are very similar to slot machines, but this would put them in all the licensed, well, they'd be available to all the licensed liquor establishments, bars, clubs, um, restaurants. So, um, so let me get this uh, straight. Let me go. Is this something that they would be able, folks would be able and, and gamble and get payoffs and then revenue, uh, tax revenue would come back to the state from the people who have the licenses to run these uh, gaming activities. Is that correct? That's correct for half of it, because uh, that would be correct for the VGTs um, with the, the uh, um, well, also with, with the skill games. They are currently out there operating um, full blast and, and they are not regulated at all. And there's no revenue coming in from the state. Right. So they would be regulated. The VGTs would be regulated up to 50,000. Uh, you know, these things could be around uh, the, the proposal they were talking about was was five at each liquor establishment. Well, this is like smoke in the sense that, you know, it, it puffed up here and, and it was even a raging fire for a while. <clears throat> and boom, all of a sudden, within a couple of days, it's gone. They could not get the votes for it. And, and there's a belief that there'll be an effort again this fall to try to do yeah. it. As you know, there's been a, a fierce debate in our state uh, from the time that gaming was introduced, uh, yes and no, uh, f lots of people for it, lots of special interests, lots against it. it what, 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 is this likely to go anywhere in the legislature? Has there been pronounced opposition to this expansion? Oh, yeah, there's been pronounced opposition from the casinos who oh, already sure. have their big piece of the pie. They don't want this, you know, cutting off some of the money they would get um, and, uh, the, the pace matic people who have a lot of these skill machines didn't like the bill, didn't like being put together with VGTs and didn't think they could compete. But the revenue that would come from something like this upwards of $300 million might force them to look at this again because of what uh, the state senator was talking about in terms of how bad the budget situation is going to be. Yeah, and they're going to look for all sorts. And you've been through many of the debates over the tax hikes over the years. The fact of the matter is they're going to have to come up with revenue and gaming revenue is, is relatively easy in the sense that you're not taxing some, you know, you're not paying property tax, you're not paying state income tax, sales tax. Uh, am I correct about that? Absolutely. You know, most there are senators who would even, you know, not like the idea of adding more gambling in Pennsylvania. My gosh, we've got it everywhere from the Internet, the casinos, the mini casinos and the racetracks. Um, but they far rather do that than vote for any kind of tax increase or even borrow, although borrowing somewhere in between and on the offensive list. Well, look, I want to thank you for coming on and you'll keep us posted on this. We'll have to see where all this goes and you know, whether it gets through the legislature or not is still an open question. And as you know, gaming legislation always has its controversies. All right. We'll see you next week for another edition of Pennsylvania Newsmakers. And as always, stay well.